and we're going to look back at this diabetes epidemic with shame. Too much sugar is literally attacking our mitochondria, which is life. Ultimately, it's a spiritual thing that's going on. You know, we want to change our lives and live the best life properly. We have to have faith, we have to have trust, we have to have a spiritual reference for our life and have meaning, a meaning to our life, a contribution in our life that's beyond ourselves. We want to turn a blind eye to things in the West. We have a cognitive dissonance, I think, for hearing hard truths about the world. But make no mistake, ignorance is not bliss. 200 years ago, humans consumed on average six to 10 pounds of sugar a year. Okay, six to 10 pounds of sugar a year. Today, the latest calculations is that we're consuming between 150 and 170 pounds of sugar each a year. It's around 2,733% increase in our dietary sugar intake, primarily over the last 50 years. Now, at least half of that is coming to us in the form of high fructose corn syrup now. So we've got sugar cane, sugar beets, and high fructose corn syrups. These are the main sources of our sugar today. So I'm not talking about just the amount of carbohydrate that is converted into glucose through, you know, all of fruits and vegetables and uh, fast food and, you know, ultra processed foods and all those carbs and all those junk foods. I'm talking about just sugar here. So we're looking at sugar cane, sugar beets, high fructose corn syrup, around 150 to 170 pounds on average a year. Now, obviously, people like me would have a minimal amount of that, but then there are other people on the other end of the spectrum that are having a lot more than that. This is the average, right? I was looking at some research the other day, and I find this so interesting, how the sugar industry has had a hold on politics, government policies, and the like for so long. So we need to go back into some of the origins of sugar and its deceit on our human history. Between the 16th century and the 19th century, there were over 12 million Africans stolen from their land, put onto ships, you know the story, and taken to different regions around the world as slaves. Now, this is before cotton. Sugar was the first one. It's estimated that 60% of them were working in the sugar slave trade, right? And that's because people in the West had this insatiable appetite for sugar. So, you know, we're going to go down a couple of rabbit holes here, and I'm going to bring it back to, you know, why sugar addiction isn't your fault, the system set up for this, and we'll get to what to do about that, right? But I think it's important to understand the history and the human cost because we make assumptions today that slavery doesn't exist. Well, today it's not called slavery, it's called forced labor. And it's estimated that there's um, about 25 million people today, in today's society, still working in forced labor. There's a combination of human trafficking, there's a combination of migrants, uh, Dominion Republic is well known for this, particularly around the sugar trade and the um, people from Haiti coming in and being forced into these camps, often lured there for a better life. And one thing that is still existing to today is that sugar barons have compounds where you cannot leave. You are basically fed, uh, basically paid absolute minimum wage, it's like a dollar a day in some of these places, one to two dollars a day if you're lucky. You are sleeping on cardboard in shanties, right, just little huts. Uh, if you want to buy water on your work home from the field, you have to buy the water from the store that the barons own. If you want to buy food, you have to buy food from the store that these barons own. And I watched some, a documentary that came out in 2005, and you would think that things would have improved. And, and there's some smoke and mirrors, things, you know, people are trying to improve these conditions, but this stuff is still existing to this day. And I'm going to post a link to that video for you to watch, even though it's older now, 18 years ago. It's important to understand that these families and these conditions are still going on today. So in this, in this 
movie, they show, I think it's called Sweet Deception, they show these compounds. And in these compounds, a group of them decided to plant some uh, food, right? To plant some fruits and vegetables. And you actually see the marshals that are uh, basically the, the private police force of the sugar barons go in and rip up the food. They're not allowed to grow food. They're often, because they're not given enough money to care, do, um, to, for, the, a lot of them still to this day, this is a big debate that's going on, they've been paying into a retirement fund, but yet there's people in their 60s and 70s still working because no one's giving them any of that. Often by the end of the week, if there's a medical bill or anything that comes in, the barons lend them money, right? It's, it's a bond situation. They will lend them the money. So most of the workers in sugar plantations today are in debt, and they'll never get out of that debt cycle. So I think this is really important that we comprehend what it is that we are voting for every time we buy sugar, cakes, lollies. We need to understand this, and it needs to land deeply, that when we're doing this, we are supporting the greediest depths of the planet, right? So forced labor today, about 25 million people in various industries, a lot of agricultural industries, uh, sugar is a big one, that is said to profit about $150 billion a year. So a lot of these regions, the governments won't touch them because these are cartels, don't get me wrong. There is very difference between a sugar cartel working in these remote areas around the world and a cocaine cartel. We want to turn a blind eye to things in the West. We have a cognitive dissonance, I think, for hearing hard truths about the world. We do like to stay in our happy little bubbles and not pay attention to the shadow sides of what's going on in our world. But make no mistake, ignorance is not bliss. This is a world that we're all voting and creating together. So you can tell I get quite emotional about these topics because it's not just what this stuff's doing to our health, our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health, our ability to function well and thrive and live the best, healthiest, long lives. There's the health of our planet and the health of our people because we are a human race. So I'm deeply passionate about us, first of all, understanding the human cost to our behavior as consumers, right? You know, I've, I've had this discussion, I had this discussion the other day with a friend, and he said, I said that I was going to be talking, you know, doing this live on the diet side of sugar, and he said, you can't tell people about the slave industry, and you can't go into those things, and I'm like, okay, here's my premise on this. I know that people that are dealing often with sugar, sugar addiction are dealing with anxiety and depression that goes hand in hand with, with how the microbiome shifts, of how the dopamine receptors in the brain shifts. I know that people crave these foods to alleviate mood, right? To avoid pain and seek pleasure. There's all of these psychological and emotional reasons why we go to these foods and then we get in the trap of it because our body becomes addicted to them for multiple reasons, right? But I also know that there are a lot of people that genuinely don't care about destroying their health. That's a hardcore truth and fact, right? You just have to look around the world to go, we know we shouldn't be doing these things. We know that we're addicted to certain things, but there are genuinely a large portion of society that don't love themselves enough to change. So my argument with this friend was, Maybe if I can share the story in my book, and it's not going to be a long one, but maybe if I can share some of the, the facts around what's going on in this world today, that maybe those people, maybe a small percentage of those people might care enough about other people to, for it to be a, a wake-up call. I really believe that awareness is the first step. I know when I changed my diet 25 years ago, and was going down this initial rabbit hole, I started looking at all of these, the truth about these industries, the truth about the food system, right? And that was enough for me to want to change. 
my consumer habits. I drove a bomby car, as you know, out of choice uh, so that I could feed my children the best food in the world. That became a value. And I would go to farmers markets to support the people that genuinely love good food and good nutrition, the land and ecosystems, and it just creates this beautiful giving and receiving of energy, right? But when we've got multinational food corporations and these massive food conglomerates and these food barons that are dictating policy at the government level, that are buying the government, essentially, right? We are no longer run by what's good for us. We're run by money. And we are voting never at the ballot box. Your vote doesn't matter whether you vote what party over what party. Ultimately, the people controlling governments are the corporations. The corporations are the ones that are making the policy decisions. That's why you'll get a new shift in government and they've made all these promises and then none of those promises very rarely are ever lived up to because they get in there and they realize, oh, we are controlled. We can't actually deal with that, right? We can't change these policies because they realize the flow-on effect of how all the systems get affected. So the vote that really counts is our consumer vote. We are buying and voting for the world we want for our children and for our grandchildren and for ourselves. And so becoming a conscious consumer matters. It really, really does. So that is the political side of it. And I could give you statistics and quotes all day long about the greed and how these different policies are made. Um, you know, an, an example is the food subsidies that the USDA put through in the 2014 um, Farm Act. They subsidize the grains, essentially, right? And corn is one of the major subsidies that farmers are given. And what that means is that you might be a farmer that runs your land at a, um, with no profit, at a loss. But the government will come in and top that money up to keep your farm going. So there was this massive shift in monoculture farming, GMOs, um, and, and corn farming, right? Um, over, what, what's that? Around a decade ago. Um, and this started earlier. Um, because you've got a guaranteed kind of lifestyle now as a farmer. So they incentivized these crops. Now, high fructose corn syrup comes from these corn subsidies. So the American government is literally funding one of the most poisonous products we could consume for our human health. And high fructose corn syrup is found in pretty much all ultra processed foods on the supermarket shelves in America. It's had a slight decrease in sales and demand over the last few years. The reason for that is that we are waking up to the, uh, to the health, uh, issues that high fructose corn syrup are having on the body. The reason for that is that if we consume too much fructose, then it becomes toxic to the liver and it can create non-fatty alcoholic liver syndrome. Um, and it also signals the body to store fat. So there's been this humongous rise in obesity with the rise parallel to high fructose corn syrup. It's cheaper than sugar, right? And there are there are import caps in America on how much sugar uh, they're allowed to bring in. I think the local sugar supply between sugarcane and sugar beets is around 80 to 90%. That would include high fructose corn syrup. So they're only allowed to import a certain amount from other regions. But they're providing these subsidies to support what the stability of these industries that are what now the, causing the number one you know, I, I would argue that, uh, that these are the number one causes of death. Um, but this massive health crisis, this huge health crisis. So, you know, I grew up in a home where my mother was a massive sugar addict. And she has been stuck in this belief for so long that you need sugar for energy, right? Sugar gives you energy. Sugar gives you energy. Now, sugar can give you a burst of glucose and insulin, right, when you first consume it. But if you have more than a teaspoonful, 
then the mitochondria literally has to process that, right? And what we do know is that there is an issue in the mitochondria itself where we have a massive amount of free radical damage done at a cellular level where sugar, too much sugar is literally attacking our mitochondria, which is life. Our mitochondria is our life force. It's what produces the energy for every cell and the health of every cell in the body. So too much of this stuff over time, particularly 150 to 170 pounds over a year, you're going to damage the mitochondria in your body. So every cell in your body becomes damaged. So you are literally at that level reversing your life expectancy, increasing age, massive amounts of accelerated aging. And you're literally, <laughs> this, is, this, is the, this is the interesting thing, because of the inflammatory effect by that, because inflammation is the body's natural defense. So our mitochondria are getting attacked by our high carb, high, high sugar diets, right? And in response to that, the body creates inflammation to kind of come in and go, hey, we've got some, some, something going on here. We need to put all our energy into kind of, you know, reducing this level of damage that's being done. So the body becomes inflamed. Now, most people are walking around with inflammation today and they don't even know it. And that's why, you know, a lot of you, when you go onto the program, all of a sudden, because this program is like the most anti-inflammatory diet you can take. You go, wow, I've, my, I can, I've got better mobility. I can, my joints aren't aching anymore. I'm just, you know, I'm feeling younger. That's because immediately that inflammation comes down. You go and eat a bunch of sugar, you'll wake up feeling 10 years older the next day because of that inflammatory response. But over time, the damage is insidious and it literally attacks the genetic expression, right? And the, and the health of these mitochondria and so over time, we are really doing ourselves a massive disservice at that deepest fundamental level. So, you know, why, what, what I'm passionate about and what my book really is about, the entire premises of, of this book, is that the ketogenic diet is not a fad diet. It's not a diet at all. It is a natural birthright, right? And it's a metabolic state and a metabolic way of being. Now, does that mean we should be in nutritional ketosis every day, all day for life? No. I go for periods of a time, you know, periods of time, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, where my body's not in nutritional ketosis. But because I'm fat adapted, my body is trained, every system in my body is trained, my muscles restore glycogen differently to everybody's out, everybody else's. My, I can restore glycogen from ketones. Your whole body metabolically, after about six to 12 months, is completely different. So there's all of these um, massive benefits to that, right? So you can get away long-term with having periods, right? It might be summer, you're growing lots of berries in your garden and you're having, you know, a, more carbohydrate. As long as they're low glycemic, they're not coming from ultra processed foods or they're not coming from sugar sources. You can go for months over summer during harvest and not consciously have to put your body into nutritional ketosis. But then look at the cycles. In winter, we're going to want to reduce those because that's how our body is, is, has evolved, we're going to want to sleep longer days because it's dark outside. We're going to want to huddle down because it's cold. We're going to want to go into a restoration and repair phase. That's a great time to be on a ketogenic diet, right? So we can't look at long-term, you know, it's this way or that way. Fat adaption is the secret. And what has caused our bodies to become unfat adap adapted primarily is sugar sugar and grains. So the other thing that the food industry knows really, really well, and that, that they hide a lot of this information because the majority of nutrition funding today is sponsored by the food industry itself, right? There's no money in diet. Who's going to fund these dietary scientific studies? Most of the studies done on babies and nutrition are the milk formula companies like Nestle, which is one of the, if not the most evil company in the world. Uh, you know, so it's very hard to kind of get any, any science or massive studies done in a field that's just focused on what I'm speaking about. Although there's lots of people doing it, mostly volunteer, 
The researchers aren't going and specifically looking for things unless there's a reason for it. So majority of our nutrition studies today have been industry-led. You know, there was this, um, this guy that came out and he, he, he proved, apparently, that sugar doesn't cause obesity. And he, um, he basically concluded that, you know, sugar doesn't cause obesity, which we know, even logically, isn't true. And then when, because science researchers have to do disclosures and looking at funding, an investigator went in and looked at his history, and he'd been given a massive grant, you know, a few years earlier by the cereal companies and by the sugar companies, right? So these, you cannot trust half the scientific information that's out there today. You've got to go into it, observe it, and go, oh, that's really interesting. So who are these researchers? What institutes do they belong in? Where are the conflicts of interests? And have they received any grants by any of these massive food corporations over the last decade? You follow the dollar and you find the truth. That's so important. It's the same in the pharmaceutical company, same in agriculture, right? And absolutely the same in food. You follow the dollar and you find the truth. So we, I think as humans, like to be in this nice bubble, oh, the government's got our back. And as a young, struggling mum, and you're tired, and you're working, and you've got two little kids, you want to go to the supermarket, you want to pick the one that's got all those ticks on it. You want to feel like somebody's got your back, right? Who do you believe? Well, I can tell you now, if it's in a box and it's pre-made, it's not good. The sugar industry know how addictive sugar is. And if you, I hope you've seen my video, um, it's also on YouTube on, you know, the truth about the food industry where I talk about, you know, fat, salt, and sugar, right? They, they call it the holy trinity in the, in the food industry. And they do multiple experiments to find that sweet bliss point where all of that is balanced for you. Uh, you know, there's also the crunch and how quickly the flavor dissolves so that, you know, by the time you finish chewing that, that potato chip, the flavor's gone and so you're craving more, right? There's all these, all these tricks. But sugar is highly addictive. Um, eight to nine out of 10 rats will always choose sugar water over cocaine. It was interesting how they discovered this. There's been multiple studies done on this now. And it was actually a, uh, a cocaine addiction researcher that discovered this. Um, and he thought that he'd just top up their diet with some sugar water. He, never, he wasn't even looking at that. And then he started recognizing, oh, they're not going for the cocaine anymore, right? So eight, eight, 80 to 90% will, will choose that over that. So let's talk about what goes on. With, with sugar and, and the addiction process. So now we've got sugar, com sugar coming into our diets. We know that it actually fundamentally attacks the mitochondria, destroys mitochondria, which is essentially destroying health at the deepest subcell level. Um, so we've got that going on. We know that it's reversing your biological age. We know that it's dramatically increasing inflammation. And this is a really interesting thing. There's a, a term called gly glycation. And how inflammation kills is we literally get cooked over time. Our cells get cooked to death. That's basically what inflammation is, right? We are cooking ourselves, which I find really, it's kind of not funny, but funny. So now, so now we've got this front end coming in. But then what is going, another layer to this, which I, is, I believe is worth mentioning, is that there is a dramatic amount of research and science coming out now to say the reason why the body tries to burn off glucose and then it stores it as fat, right? So, so if we've got too much sugar because we've just had a massive sugar intake from that meal or we've been eating a bag of lollies or whatever, don't forget anything over one teaspoon is too much for your body. You cannot absorb more than that. The body's going to keep, you know, the insulin's going to keep bombarding those cells. And over time, a high sugar diet's going to create um, insulin resistance where the cells are so sick and tired of it, right, that they become uh, desensitized to insulin. So that's leading towards the diabetes ones. But most people aren't even aware that this is impacting everybody, diabetic or not. 
So what happens though is that the insulin will go, oh, they don't, that cell doesn't need that. Um, there's enough energy in there for the mitochondria to do its thing for now. So I'll, I'm going to wrap a lipid around, I'm going to convert it into lipids, and I'm going to store this fat for later, right? So glucose is a, is a fat-increasing storage thing, without a doubt. So, of course, sugar causes obesity, right? That's just a crazy thing that it's incredible, the insanity of what some of these people come out with. So now we've got sugar and insulin, which is the fat storage, fat store, fat store, fat store, fat store hormone. Now, this is how people gain weight, and it's also how people can't get off the cycle. If you do not reverse this metabolic underlying factor, right, and what I mean by that is you have to get fat adapted. You have to reverse this mechanism of how your body is literally metabolically made, right? Because if you don't, and you go onto my diet for a couple of months, and you don't become fat adapted, and you go back to the way that you're eating, you're going to gain that weight back. So yes, you can regain weight on a ketogenic diet if you're not fat adapted, just like you gain weight on any diet, right? Like all of them. The secret is you have to reverse this metabolic damage so that your body is now trained not to store fat, but to burn fat. And so, you know, I had this conversation with Teresa the other day. She said, have you had a discussion with, with Matt about um, whether you can get fat on a ketogenic diet? I'm like, oh, no. It's virtually impossible to do that. There's some mechanisms that we have to do in the medical diets with people with cancer to make sure that they keep fat on their bodies, right? But what happens when you're fat adapted, and it's so funny when Matt and I go out for dinner because we sit there and we start eating and we're stripping our clothes off, is that there is this thing on the cellular level called um, uncoupling. So our, our body, will cons our cells will consume all the ketones that we're producing from the fat intake of our meal, and then the mitochondria will take what it needs, turn that into adenosine triphosphate, right? Once we've got enough energy in the cell, it will take the excess ketones and it will, do, it will take it through this process, basically called uncoupling, where it literally burns that extra energy at the cellular level. So I only found out about this about seven years ago and Matt used to come over for dinner every week and I was like, why do I get hot? And he starts sweating, like, why do I get hot every time I, I eat? And he said, well, this is what's going on. Your body is such a fat burner that you burn the extra fat off, right? Instead of storing it like the rest of the world does. So once you are fat adapted, your body has retrained in miraculous ways that is... I found virtually impossible to undo. I have literally, over the last several months, been trying to see if I can undo fat adaption in my body, putting myself through a human experiment, right? Um, since I've been in Bali, I'm having a big bowl of fruit every morning. I'm doing everything. I mean, I'm still eating food that's not ultra-processed, and I'm still eating a healthy diet, but I still cannot gain weight. I still cannot undo my fat adaption. So I'm kind of like thinking to myself, how far do I take this? Because I know I feel better the other way, you know, when I'm, when I'm producing more ketones. But um, so far, I haven't really had any negative side effects. Um, so it just goes to show, you know, and I've, I've had periods, you know, when I went to Europe for six weeks, where I'm not eating ketogenically at all. I'll eat pizza and pasta in Rome, I'll do all those things, I'll have desserts at degustation places. But they, the, 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 it doesn't undo things. I'll go home, go back on my diet, it's reset. So your body resets. So this is really important to understand. This isn't so much about losing weight, right? This is about getting your body back into the optimal healthy state so that instead of destroying mitochondria throughout the rest of your life, your mitochondria is thriving because it loves ketones. Another thing that's really, really important when it comes to health here is that Different organ systems become insulin resistant. Why? Because of too much glucose in our diets, too much insulin circulating our bodies because of all this bloody sugar and carbohydrates we're eating, right? So as different organs become insulin resistant, say the kidneys, we're going to end up with kidney disease. It's a major killer. The heart, we're going to end up with heart disease. The brain, we're going to end up with dementia or Alzheimer's, right? These different systems, and this is where the research into metabolic health right now is really ramping up, is it's pretty much already been proven, right, 
that different breakdowns of organ systems is a direct response to a type of resist insulin resistance in the body. So what does that tell us? Maybe we've got this whole glucose as our primary fuel source thing wrong, right? That's just logical. So I'm going to park that to the side. We know why, right? We know the greed, we know the corruption, we know that slavery still exists, we know the health consequences, we know those things. So I'm going to just park that to the side and let's come down to the, the cycle of addiction. There are a number of mechanisms in how we become addicted to sugar and carbohydrates. The, one of them is that it alters our microbiome, right? Our whole immune system um, becomes altered as a response, right? Our immune system um, primarily is in our microbiome, our gut. So we are 10 times more bacteria, yeast, and viruses than we are human cells, right? Most of you would have heard me say that before. Bacteria is so microscopic to the size of each human cell. Um, so we think, oh, no, we're, we're mostly made up of human cells. Well, actually, depending on what paradigm you live in or how you look at it, we are more bacteria than we are human. Isn't that interesting? So we are this ecosystem, right? We've got over 30, 35 trillion cells within our body. We've got 10 times that in bacteria. Now, as our diet alters, our microbiome will shift. And within the microbiome, there is this, uh, basically, it's like, I love this. It's a bit like a war analogy, right? We've got a globe, and we've got certain bacteria fighting other bacteria. We've got this bacteria over this bacteria. And there's kind of this bit of a war going on in an unhealthy body. If we consume too much sugar, too much ultra-processed foods, that's going to shift and we're going to end up with more bad bacteria, more pathological bacteria that's going to continue to degrade our immune system and our overall health, right? We'll become more susceptible to gut issues, uh, various conditions, autoimmune conditions, uh, all sorts of chaos is, you know, basically starting in this microbiome level. So as we eat lots of sugar and we become really heavily reliant on sugar, that microbiome shifts, and now the balance of power is run by the negative bacteria, right? So these particular types of sugar-loving bacteria will communicate to the brain through the enteric nervous system, which runs from the esophagus all the way down to the anus. You've got neurons going down there. They will communicate electrical signals to your brain to tell you to eat more sugar to feed them because that's what they live off, right? So if you've got a population of this sugar-loving bacteria in there and the accompanied yeasts, such as Candida albicans, that mutated form of Candida that releases acetaldehyde, which is a bit like an alcohol, sugar addicts are basically drunk half the time. That's what brain fog is, literally. It's, like, it's a form of alcohol in the, in the brain and in the body system where people feel tired and kind of drunk. That's the exactly what, what's going on, right? So now we've got this whole system that is kind of poisoning our body, right? And we become addicted to the sugar because the microbiome is now ruling us. We, we are pretty much ruled through our cravings and our desires by our bacteria, not by our human desire. And that's why I say this is a complex situation to look at, right? So we need to understand that every time we give in to those cravings, every time we listen to that, every time we play out that behavior, we're fueling the very problem. I look at it a bit like this. You've got an entity inside your body that is ruling you. You've got an entity in there that is telling you what to do, right? So as soon as you wake up to this, you go, I'm not. I'm not craving the sugar. That dirty fungus in my gut is craving that sugar. That horrible microbiome, and you need to shift. So this is why eating cultured foods and why there's such an emphasis on the healing foods and the gut health in our program, because we want you to keep working away at shifting your microbiome. That's what the healing phase is, right? 
we want you to start bringing in the good, healthy bacteria because as you start repopulating that, there will be a microbiome shift where you are now primarily uh, desiring and craving healthy food. And we see that in the program all the time, right? I can't believe I used to eat that. I've got no desire for that anymore because who's running the show? So we can come at this from a mindset perspective, but let's just look at the nuts and bolts of the physical body here for a moment. One of the big issues that we've got here is that we know that serotonin and dopamine are primarily produced in the gut. These are the feel-good neurotransmitters. Dopamine is the reward-based one. Serotonin is primarily a mood regulator. So these are produced in the gut, right? So anxiety and depression is not a neurological or a mental problem for a lot of people. It's a microbiome problem. So we need to understand this. So you can't just take an antidepressant and try and block in more serotonin in your brain and get that circulating without fixing the cause, right? The cause. So as we shift our microbiome, there is a dramatic shift in our mental health and our mood regulation. And this is where there's so much incredible evidence and so much promising research going into this field by researchers to say, hey, the anti-anxiety medications, the antidepressants, these pharmaceuticals are doing absolutely bloody nothing. And here's all the side effects. But hey, if we use these probiotics and if we shift our diet, we can actually restore the problem. We can regulate mood. We can regulate anxiety. Now, food is medicine, right? This is so important. So we can't rely on a system that's broken to give us broken food and patch us up with another bloody pharmaceutical and expecting any of these problems at a fundamental level to change. Because ultimately, that the health of the mitochondria and what you're fueling it on is also impacting this microbiome, which is creating these desires for your body, right? It's all one system. So now let's come over to dopamine and the addiction cycle. We know that as soon as we eat something sweet, and this comes from human evolution from our past, because in our hunter-gatherer days, if there was berries, that we, we wanted to eat those berries, right? So we were rewarded by a sweet taste because we'd get instant energy. So that was such a tiny, minute amount. Produce today... Is, is hundreds of times sweeter than what the hybrids were. I had this discussion the other day. The apples that we had in our fields 200 years ago were sour. Today, you can look at the apples, how farmers have basically hybridized through breeding programs to get them sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. So a carrot today is as sweet as the sweetest apple was 100 years ago. So we have literally been breeding into our fruits and vegetables as much sugar as we can. Why? Because you're going to want more. So it's not just the 150 to 170 pounds of sugar that we're now consuming as opposed to 6 to 10. It's the sugar in your fruits and vegetables that we're getting more, right? We have become addicted to the taste. And it's really important to understand that that was originally a survival mechanism. That's why any of you that have breastfed or have tasted breast milk, it's super sweet. That was put there for babies to want to suckle at the breast. And breast milk, by the way, is 50% um, fat. And the sweetness is mostly made up of different oligosaccharides, one of them being fructo, like a fructo oligosaccharide, which tastes sweet, but it's very high in fiber. So breast milk has a very, very low glycemic index, despite tasting sweet, right? So this is how nature was set up to ensure that the baby wanted to, would survive. But we haven't kind of figured that out in our evolution that we don't need sweet things like that anymore. So now we have an entire globe, pretty much, that's addicted to sugar. And what happens when we consume it, we're not only getting these insulin spikes across the day, and creating all of these highs and lows across the day that, you know, as soon as you eat sugar, you're going to crave more sugar, you're going to crave more sugar. You, the cycle begins as soon as you start, particularly you start in the morning, you are screwed all day. It is virtually impossible to use free will or logic to stop that cycle because your body is now trying to 
um, basically rebalance its blood sugar level. It's trying to balance it. So we've now got this cycle of, um, you know, being addicted to the sweet taste from the blood sugar level uh, perspective, but also because it dramatically increases dopamine, the reward center of the brain. So we eat it and we feel high. We feel, you know, why does, why does eight, to, eight to nine, you know, nine out of 10 rats prefer sugar to cocaine? Even though cocaine exponentially, you know, increases dopamine, like most recreational drugs, right? Alcohol is uh, highly addictive as well, but that works a lot on the serotonin. It's a psychoactive. It's working more on the serotonin pathways, although dopamine is slightly there. It's a mood regulator, right? So people do alcohol for mood regulation directly through the serotonin pathway. But sugar, let's stick to sugar and, and recreational drugs here. It is that high in dopamine that allows us to feel calm, to feel high, to feel safe, to feel comforted, right? So we're going about our day and we've got this unhealthy microbiome that's craving sugar and we have been programmed since er early childhood. Oh. Early childhood. Our culture, our grandmothers, our parents, our school systems, our sports fields programmed us to reward ourselves with sugar. So we can't help the fact that, hey, you did well at sports today. Here, take a chocolate bar or a lollipop out of the bag. Hey, you did really well on your maths test today. Come and get a lolly. Fuck that. Schools should not be allowed sugar. It should be a blanket policy. No sugar rewards at all. At all. There should be no juices. There should be no nothing like that in school canteens, and no way and how should we be rewarding children with sugar? Because now look at what the problem is. We've trained a dopamine reward pathway in our brains that if we're feeling sad, we're going to subconsciously link that back to feeling good because we were good one. We were good little Johnny and good little Sally, right? So we got some sugar and that made us feel important. We related that to love and connection and significance. So when we're feeling insignificant and we're feeling lonely, we're going to reach for sugar because in our neural pathways, in our brain, in our memory, we know because it's wired into our brain, our predictive machine, that if I eat sugar, those feelings are going to go now. I'm going to feel safe, secure, loved in those moments. So it's not just, hey, here's dopamine. When you have sugar, you become a dopamine addict. It is far more complex than that. It is how our brain has been wired over time, right? And, you know, I really, I am so against parents rewarding and grandparents that think they have the right to put a high-class toxin that's worse than cocaine into a child's mouth and think that they have the right to do that. It is child abuse. It, without a doubt, it is child abuse. You can tell how angry I get about this. Because when you understand the whole picture of what's going on, why is it socially acceptable? Why is it okay? We have to shift our awareness around these issues and look at where they're coming from, right? I work with women over 40 all the time, right? Women over 35, 40, 50, and 60s. A lot of the issues that is going on in our community around food addiction started when we were little children, started with reward-based eating. You know, the celebration times. Let's celebrate with this cake. Let's celebrate with, you know, all of these things. And that linked in our mind love and connection, right, and community, which is why we're all driven. So what happens when we're lonely? Our brain's going to link back to sweets. We commiserated often. You know, oh, you lost the game today, but let's go off and get an ice cream, right? Oh, you won the game today. Let's go and get an ice cream. You know, like, we don't recognize how complex our addictions are and truly where they came from because no one's linking all of these pieces of the puzzle together. So we do have a society that uses sugar as comfort and we have a society and some people will 
eat when they're angry, right? To suppress the emotions because the next layer to this is we have not been taught emotional security, how to regulate our immune systems, how to breathe properly, how to calm ourselves, how to look at life in a different way with faith and trust and you know, be able to tell ourselves that we're going to be okay, which is why I always say, ultimately, it's a spiritual thing that's going on. You know, we want to change our lives and live the best life properly. We have to have faith. We have to have trust. We have to have a spiritual reference for our life and have meaning, a meaning to our life, a contribution in our life that's beyond ourselves. We need to make meaning in the insanity often, right? So there's so many complexities. So we cannot blame ourselves if we ever become addicted to sugar. There is nothing on a personal level because I think so, here's the other thing that I just find so sad. People that are addicted to sugar are often doing these things in private and I get very emotional because I know what women go through. They're doing it in private and then the guilt and the shame that they feel is horrendous. And there are genes that are altered now in about 3 to 5% of young children that have no mechanism now because of the mitochondrial damage to be able to shut off the, um, the ghrelin, you know, this, this, the leptin and ghrelin, the hunger hormone and the society hormone are out of balance. They're all being resistant now. So people don't know how to shut off that feeling of hunger. So, we often will blame people for being obese or being overweight and we can criticize them and we can look at what they're eating out in public and go, oh, they shouldn't be eating that. You know, it's just like, who gives anyone the fucking right <laughs> to judge somebody, right? Yes, nobody should be eating ultra-processed food. No, especially obese people. But do you know what? There's other stuff going on where it's actually not their fault. So we, again, we need to stop the judgment of what's going on but I know that people are often doing this in private and the guilt and the shame and they're not feeling as though they can get themselves together, that they're not strong enough, that they lack willpower, that they're a failure. All of the consequences and the side effects of that, that's what hurts me. That's why I got tears talking about that because, again, this is why we relate this back to self-love. Because a lot of these things, when we add all these dots together, are stripping away you're set up for failure out there, girls. So we need to bring awareness to this. And it comes down to how do we stop this cycle, right? How do we get off this cycle when it's so hard? There is withdrawal symptoms. The first thing to do is know how to regulate your nervous system. Because there are multiple side effects to lots of sugar. One is that it drives up cortisol. One of it that it's, you know, giving us this false sense of energy, right? We get stressed. We get anxious. It, it's all tied into the nervous system. So we need to first of all learn how to breathe, how to regulate our nervous system, how to return to a place of safety, how to comfort ourselves, and how to lean into emotion instead of avoiding emotion. That's the first thing to me because until we can cope with the next step, which is withdrawing from sugar, doing a sugar detox, you know, eating our way to health, changing our microbiome so that we're not ruled by this fungus and this bacteria anymore, making that physical shift, knowing the things to eat to create a healthy gut, a health, which is a healthy brain, a healthy mood, right? Putting those feel good foods into the body to stimulate high amounts of natural dopamine, which is most of the foods in your program, proteins, fish, chicken, nuts, they're all foods that are high in tryptophan, which is the precursor to serotonin, which helps you regulate your mood. So we want tryptophan-rich foods, right? So we need to look at this as a complex issue and go, okay, I know what the problem is. I can see all these different dots now. I know it's not my fault. Focus on meditation, learning how to calm your mind, right? Knowing how to regulate your, you know, your mood. And this is why I often say, if you are stuck in food addiction, forget the freaking diet right now, right? Make some healthy choices, but work on these essential skills first, right? Self-love, how to regulate your, your emotions and your nervous system. Focus on that, and that's going to set you up for success when you make the changes and make that switch, there are certain things that you can start bringing into your diet that's going to help stimulate tryptophan to help you regulate serotonin. 
You need to look at the gut. You need to look at leaky gut and the gut health, right? That's why we do the gut health challenge to restore the essential foundation for these biochemical drivers that's going on. And we need to call bullshit on how we've been programmed for food to fill our emotional needs. Our six essential needs are met through this. How we get sidetracked in our subconscious mind that sugar's going to fill a need because I'm lonely, I'm sad, I'm angry, right? So once we bring awareness, which is why this community is so important, which is why it's so comprehensive, we are training you in all of these different areas, right? We're, we're giving you these life skills in these different areas so that you can make a permanent change and you'll be able to go back to being fat adapted and reverse your biological age, stay fit and young as long as you can, right? Until your time is up so that you don't have to rely on pharmaceuticals because you're taking care of your health at the deepest level. There is not a pill in the world that will bypass what you're able to do yourself for your mitochondria, for your own life force energy, right? So I want you to know that I know very deeply that, you know, food addiction at this level is fucking hard, right? I've watched my mother with this. But we need to educate ourselves. And we need to get inspired to educate ourselves because we love ourselves enough to do that. And I, I really believe that through learning about things, little pieces of the puzzle start click, 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 right? And eventually, as we chip away at these things, that switch in our brain, that switch in our consciousness naturally happens. And we're returning ourselves to self-love and self-worth. And we know that we can do it. And so I have huge compassion for those of you that are stuck in this cycle. My advice is get rid of every processed food in your house. Get rid of your sugar. Um, you know, drive a different way home from work, not past that drive through or don't go to that cafe where you're buying that cake or that muffin. Change your life habits. The things that are on those automatic cues Go to a different supermarket that you don't know, even if you have to drive across town. Change the things that are in your subconscious mind that are triggering those automatic cues. If you sit down and watch Netflix or a show and there's a, a, a pattern around food, stop watching TV for a couple of months. Start focusing on documentaries and, you know, just, just really start doing the small things that you can to change. But it's really important we're wanting, when we are wanting to change an automatic wiring in our body and in our brain, that we do things differently. So the brain's on more alert and we're not getting those subconscious cues. Oh, there's the McDonald's sign. There's that, right? So start with the small amounts of things that you can do. But, you know, we know that, you know, the program, the 30-day challenge um, or, you know, going straight into the healing phase is the fastest way of, getting you off the cycle because you're able to get those ketones and you're able to shut down the hunger hormone you're able to resensitize to insulin and leptin so there's all these hormonal changes that are going on at the body right at the inflammatory and hormone balancing level right but then the food addiction side of it, it's so important to understand how to regulate these other things right so that you can cope with the trigger things um, that occur in your life. So.